first spot. And begin. Good afternoon. You will be the Google Board of Directors, and we are the internal consultants tasked with analyzing Google's decision of firing James Dumar. Imagine, you walk into work one morning, and you hear a fellow male employee say, did you see the email the boss sent? Did you get a little stress from it? Oh, what am I saying? Of course you did. You're a woman. Or imagine you walk into work one morning and you hear a fellow female employee say, how sad was it that Janice from accounting got fired? Oh, what am I saying? You don't have feelings. You're a man. Well, as you know, it is harmful gender stereotypes like these that form the basis for a memo released by former software engineer, James Damore. Google Board of Directors, thank you for having us here today. My name is Mackenzie Gretzner, and these are my fellow Googlers, John Dipplesen, Michelle Johnson, Emily Johnson, and Jesenia Duarte. In 2017, James Damore released a memo entitled, Google's Ideological Echo Chamber. This began floating around Google, and it caused disagreement amongst Google internally and throughout the public. In it, James Damore asserted that the biological differences between men and women were partly to cause for the gaps seen in income, employment, and representation in leadership here at Google as well as in the technology field in general. Damore asserted several claims including that women on average have more neuroticism which leads to greater levels of anxiety in the workplace, and that men demonstrate a greater variance in IQ than women, and Google's tendency to pick from the top of the curve may result in a smaller candidate pool consisting of females. He then goes on to state that us here at Google, by ignoring these differences, are fostering a culture of silence, divisiveness, and discrimination, and he provides several recommendations for how we can improve our company culture. Now this sparked a nationwide debate on the ideas of workplace diversity. And because of the public backlash, as well as the internal disagreement over what to do after the release of this memo, we were left with two options. To either retain and train him more, put him through some sort of sensitivity training, or to fire him. Through this presentation, we intend to show you why our decision to fire James Damore was the correct and right decision to make through an ethical, business, and legal perspective. First, we will be giving you a high-level business overview of the case, show you what Google's culture looked like at the time of Demore's termination, which will provide a framework for our legal and ethical analysis further in the presentation. We will then explain whether or not it was legal for us here at Google to fire James Demore. This will provide more clarity on DeMore's lawsuit that he has currently filed against us, as well as explain some of the legal implications we took on when we fired him. Then, we will give you an ethical overview of our decision to fire James DeMore. This will prove or show why we believe that DeMore's continued presence here at, Ju here at Google would provide, a, would provide negative connotations for our employees, their productivity, and our values. Finally, we will leave you with some recommendations for how to move forward so that we, when confronted with a situation similar to this, we can either mitigate it or avoid it in entirety. I would now like to have John give you a business overview of our case. Thanks, Kenzie. Uh, thank you for laying out the memo and the uh, basic decision Google had to face. Now that, we can, now that we have that information, we can look at the issue from a business, legal, and ethical perspective. I'm John Dillison, and I'll be taking you through the business portion of that analysis. <clears throat> As you know, Google is one of the largest technology companies in the world. We have over 70,000 employees across 50 countries. And last year, we uh, achieved $110 billion in revenue. This was primarily from our two advertising products, Google AdSense, or Google AdWords, uh, which serves ads on Google's network of sites, including Google Search, YouTube, Gmail, and within Google Apps on the iOS and Android platforms, and Google AdSense, which serves ads on partner websites. These two products make up over 86% of our revenue. Behind our business is our unique corporate culture. We are known worldwide for our um, culture, and open discourse and self-expression is a key aspect of that culture. 
employees um, regularly share um, on forums, email lists, and discussion groups that we provide um, internally. And as part of that discourse, employees are not only encouraged but expected to provide feedback to management on issues they deem important and that will improve Google in the future. The Demore memo was a direct product of this type of, of mindset and culture. Uh, as you also know, our workforce is heavily male dominated. Only 31% of our employees are female and they are outnumbered in technology and leadership roles by over three to one. So one of our key commitments as a company has been building a Google for everyone. One that is more representative of the customers we serve and the uh, world as a whole. And we've been making great strides towards this goal. The DeMore memo hinders this progress by saying what it did about the women in our workforce. As Daniel Brown, our VP of Diversity, sums up nicely, part of building an open, inclusive environment means fostering a culture in which those with alternative views feel safe sharing their opinions. But that discourse needs to work alongside the principles of equal employment found in our code of conduct, policies, and anti-discrimination laws. Sundar had to make the ultimate decision to fire no more. It was not a unanimous decision within Google, um, and there was a lot of tension behind that. He ultimately sided on um, the side of firing, citing portions of the memo that crossed the line by advancing harmful gender stereotypes and specific instances of which women in our workforce felt judged and stereotyped solely based on their gender. Behind the workforce um, were business implications. We don't see any direct financial implications from the firing or the controversy that surrounded it. Uh, our business is primarily <coughs> B2B and is somewhat insulated from the public controversy and outcry um, on both sides. However, where we do see this um, affecting us greatly is our ability to, to retain and attract a talented workforce. To cite a specific example, two female engineering candidates um, have already withdrawn their applications for employment, specifically citing the memo uh, as a reason for doing so. By firing to more, we can take a stand and saying these are not the views that Google expresses or holds. With the a talented workforce um, comes a better ability to innovate and improves our long-term competitiveness in the future. Studies have shown that a more diverse and inclusive workforce um, will lead to above average financial returns in the future. Again, as Danielle Brown um, states, diversity and inclusion are a fundamental part of our values and they are critical to our success as a company. Now that I have taken you through the business case, I hope you can see why the decision to fire tomorrow was the correct one to make. And Michelle will now be taking you through the legal aspects of our decision. Thank you, John. I'm Michelle Johnson, and now that John has given us a business overview, I'm going to walk us through the legal risks that we faced in making the decision to fire tomorrow. At the time of tomorrow's memo, we were and we still are undergoing an investigation by the United States Labor Board into the alleged gender pay gap at Google. Shortly after his memo, three former female Google employees um, filed a class action lawsuit for the alleged gender pay gap. In Silicon Valley, many other companies are facing similar issues and lawsuits, such as Facebook, Upload VR, uh, Oracle, who is being sued by the Department of Labor over the gender pay gap, and Twitter being sued for gender discrimination. As you know, as the board of directors, every decision that you make, you have to consider the business or the, excuse me, the legal implications and legal risks. And in our case, we had to look at the legal risks of firing more and in retaining more. When we made that examination, we looked at the potential claims that Demore may have, and any um, laws that may prohibit us from firing more. Under California law, there is at-will employment, and California gives special protection for political speech and activities. Under the Federal National Labor Relations Act. There's protection for concerted activity. So California being an at-will employment state, meaning that either party can terminate employment at any time for any reason, unless another law explicitly prohibits it. In our case, DeMore was fired specifically for the harmful gender stereotypes in his memo. So then we have to ask, are we prohibited for, from firing him for those statements? So like I said, in California, 
they get special protection for politi political activities, and that has been broadly interpreted to also include social movements. And in our case, Demora's comments are likely to fall under the um, issue and gender movement of gender equality, meaning that his statements have the potential to be protected. California courts have ruled that government employees could have their political speech restricted, but there's no clear precedent in this case on how a court would rule on Demora's speech. We then examine if Demore were to submit a complaint to the National Labor Relations Board under the National Labor Relations Act for um, protection of concerted activity. In asking whether it's concerted, it would be whether Demore did it on behalf of himself and other employees. Did he do it to benefit other employees? And did he do it in a way that causes it to lose protection? Meaning he violated company rules or he did something that disrupted the business. In our case, excuse me, uh, in our case, um, although parts of Demore's memo would likely be protected as concerted, the discriminatory comments he made would be shown, we believe, to be disruptive to the business and also to violate our company rules, meaning that they would lose protection. Then in considering the legal risks of retaining Demore, we had to look at the potential claims that we would face for a hostile work environment. So under California law and the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964, in order to find a hostile work environment, it has to be based upon gender, has to be severe or pervasive, has to alter working conditions or create an abusive environment, and the employer has to be liable. It's also key to note here that in order for it to be shown to be severe or pervasive, it can't be a one-time incident. Meaning that if Demore were to have conduct in the future that was shown to create a hostile work environment, there's a very public, clear record of his feelings about women and the conduct in releasing his memo, which could potentially show that this was pervasive and severe. And in that case, we as an employer would be liable. And if Demore were to ever be in a supervisor role, we would especially be liable in that case. What did happen was Demore filed a complaint with the NLRB. And in uh, January of 2018, he withdrew that complaint. But shortly after, the NLRB still published an advice memo saying that absent his withdrawal, the claim should have been dismissed. They specifically stated, that his statements were so harmful, discriminatory, and disruptive as to be unprotected. Although the NLRB memo is not binding, it gives us guidance into how a court would likely rule in this case. Given the legal climate in Silicon Valley and in Google at that time, and balancing these legal risks, as well as looking at our business interests and our values, we believe that firing Demore was the correct legal action to take. Emily will now give us an ethical overview of our case. Thank you, Michelle. So, so far you've heard from John, who's provided us with uh, the business implications surrounding uh, the memo, and you heard from Michelle, who's given us the legal climate. My name is Emily Johnson, and I'm now going to provide with you an ethical analysis. When this memo was first released, we were tasked with acting swiftly in response as James Demore's employment status hung in the balance. We could either retain Demore as an employee with the option of disciplinary action or provide an avenue for training, or we could fire Demore. Through this ethical analysis, we hope to show you that the correct ethical decision was in fact to fire James Demore. When we began to conduct our ethical analysis, we carved out who our three main key stakeholders were gonna be. That's gonna be us here at Google, our employees at Google, as well as James Demore himself as his own separate entity. So I'd like to now kind of provide you with how we conducted our ethical analysis. We utilized a framework that focused in on four main ethical areas to kind of gain an all-encompassing look at the main moral insight. And those four areas are interests, rights, duties, and characters. So breaking each area down a little bit further, when we talk about interests, we're mostly talking to outcome. So this is a cost-benefit analysis that maximizes the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people. When we look at the rights, this the most ethical decision under rights is gonna be one that focuses on our most important entitlements as a company and each of our stakeholders' most entitlements as people and employees. When we break it down into duties, the most ethical <coughs> decision under duties is gonna be one that focuses on our obligations as a company to our employees, their obligations to us, and then their obligations to each other. And lastly, we're gonna talk about the area of character. 
The most ethical decision to make under the area of character is one who and is one that which we consider who each of the stakeholder wants to be. And here at Google, it's one that focuses in on our culture. So breaking this down a little bit further, we'll start with the area of interest. So here at Google, as you may know, our main interest as a company is to maintain a productive work environment, one that focuses on our bottom line. And the interest of our employees here is to have an inclusive culture, one that they can participate in freely. And the interest of James Damore is to contribute to the culture that we promote of open discourse. So when we kind of look at um, each of the stakeholders' main interests and how they relate to the employment status of James Damore, we can see that James Damore's interest to contribute to a culture of open discourse would give us a reason to potentially retain him as an employee. However, when we weigh our interests at Google to maintain a productive workforce and provide our culture of inclusivity, the correct um, ethical decision underneath this framework is to fire James Damore. It maximizes the greatest amount of interest. Moving on to the area of rights. So as you can remember, this um, focuses on our entitlements. So here at Google, um, as you know, we have a right to determine our workforce as well as shape our culture however we, we see fit. And our employees also have a right to enjoy a safe workplace, one that we can provide for them. And lastly, um, James Damore, he has a right to express his concerns as management as an employee here at Google. So again, when we look at how this relates to the employment status of James Damore, we can recognize that James Damore absolutely has a right to express his concerns to management, and that could give us a reason to potentially retain him. However, our rights at Google to determine our workforce and our culture and um, the rights of our employees um, would point to us the most ethical decision to fire James Damore. The next area that we looked into was duties. And our duties are obligations as a company and obligations to one another as employees. So the duty as us at Google here is to provide a respectful work in, or workplace for all of our employees. And our employees have a duty um, to perform their job effectively. James Damore also has a duty as an employee to treat his coworkers with courtesy and respect. Now as you can see some tension forming in some of the other areas, um, within duties specifically, all of the obligations point to firing Damore. He was not treating his coworkers with courtesy and respect. Our employees were unable to perform their jobs effectively due to the nature of the memo, and then accepting the memo would not be providing our employees with a respectful workplace. And the last ethical area that we focused in on was character. Now this relates to who we want to be and who our stakeholders want to be, and the character traits that they want to emulate. Here at Google, our CEO, as you know, prides himself on a culture of diversity, inclusivity, and innovation. Keeping that in mind, we want to be able to act justly and fairly on behalf of our employees. But it's also important to note that in releasing this memo, Damore acted courageously um, and participated in this culture of open discourse. So although he was acting courageously in putting out this memo, the contents of this memo were not in line with who we want to be at Google in promoting diversity, inclusivity, and innovation. And because of that, the most ethical decision would be to fire Demore under character. So as John pointed out in the business overview, the decision to fire Demore was not unanimous at first. And you can see why there's a lot of conflict and a lot of gray area within each of these ethical decisions. However, when you take it as a whole, we can arrive at one moral insight to fire James Damore. This is because Damore did not improve Google's culture long term, um, business, and the culture with Google in itself. The, he did contribute to a policy of open discourse, one in which we promote. However, this policy has its limitations, and his discussion ultimately became unproductive. Lastly, releasing this memo did not show prudence on the part of James Damore, and he showed a lack of thought and um, courtesy to his coworkers. So, so far we've shown you through a business perfect per perspective that um, the correct decision was to fire Demore. We've showed you legally that we are allowed to fire Demore. And lastly, hopefully through our ethical perspective, we should have showed you that we should fire Demore. I'll now hand it off to Jacenio, who will give you some recommendations moving forward. Thank you, Emily, for that detailed ethical overview. Now that you've heard the business, legal, and ethical pieces of this case, where do we go from here? My name is Jacenio Duarte, and I'm going to offer you actionable recommendations to take. As board members of one of the most innovative and renowned STEM companies in the entire world, I know that you are all aware and proud of the value that diversity brings to us here at Google. 
As you also know, our VP of Diversity, Danielle Brown, has made great strides with inclusion initiatives in order to strengthen our culture. Nonetheless, at Google, we confide in consistently striving for progress and to be better. As internal consultants, we have developed and proposed actionable insights that I will explain and describe in order to better help manage situations like these should they occur in the future. These, situ these tools, we are confident, will help create a better Google for yourself as board members, for our employees across all campuses, and for our customers around the world. First, providing guidelines and an open discourse policy. Next, defining and clearly communicating Google's diversity goals. And lastly, fostering a respectful work environment for everybody. Starting with guidelines and open discourse, we want to really be able to um, suggest having the terms of use, the code of conduct, either pinned to the top or the bottom or a sidebar of the discussion board in order to ensure easy visibility for our employees so that when they go, so we want to still encourage them posting, but just make sure that they are able to have that easy access and be reminded of Google's code of conduct and um, what, what we stand for before they post. Next, we would we propose an award encouragement system. This would include recognition awards, uh, such as extra innovation days or trips to different Google campuses to encourage meaningful contributions. And we could even have, if there are certain posts or suggestions that Google would decide to like test out or implement, it would be able to increase our innovation as well. Next, defining and communicating diversity goals. We really want to educate new employees during our, during our onboarding process. There are certain topics that we offer interactive online training for that we have to do legally, and we find that employees are able to retain that knowledge more thoroughly and more long-term uh, as opposed to other training tools. So we really want to take diversity and inclusion initiatives and do interactive training. We could even do speakers or things that they have to engage with, and that could be also something that they would have to retest every six months or a year in order to stay compliant as a Google employee. Next, defining clear metrics and end goals for our diversity programs. This is something that we really would like to emphasize and also uh, emphasize heavily that these programs and these employee resource groups are available to all employees at Google who wish to participate. Last, publishing state of the workforce reports annually, showing really where we are currently with diversity, where we strive to be, and how important those are to our bottom line. Next, uh, fostering a respectful work environment, applying rules fairly and consistent, consistently. This is very important as we want to make sure that every that everything is addressed appropriately. When James Damore released his memo, unfortunately there were actions and statements that were brought up by other individuals and threats towards him. Again, we want to make sure that those are addressed and we apply those rules fairly and equally across the board. Next, providing a system for formal and transparent feedback about management. A lot of what James Damore wrote in his memo is fair to question, and we encourage that bringing up. We want to make sure that our employees feel they are supported and they are encouraged to bring up situations or any issues they might have with management, and we want to be able to address those appropriately as well. Next, we suggest <coughs> implementing the Googler Plus One mentoring program. We already have basic pro mentoring programs at Google, but this takes it one step further. We would go ahead and pair a senior Google employee with a new hire, preferably in the same department. We would take that senior employee who's well versed and immersed in Google's culture and very represented of their values and pair them again with a new hire where they can form a, a mentoring, where they can form a fulfilling and diverse partnership. We're hoping to again get people from diverse backgrounds and that can continue as a mentorship, you know, however long that they want the partnership to continue, um, but for sure at least within the six months to a year of them becoming a new hire at Google. We have done thorough research and utilized organizations such as Project Include, which focus specifically on creating a strong, inclusive culture in STEM companies. And we're certain that these actions are pertinent to our success at Google. Now that I have given you actionable insights on where we go from here, Kenzie will conclude our presentation. Thank you, Jacenia. Now that you've heard our analysis, our decision, and our recommendations, I would like to leave you with four main takeaways from the presentation today. 
The first is that as we continue to make, make diversity and, conclusion, and inclusion critical to our success, we need to keep these at the forefront of our business moving forward. Second, we minimize our current and future risk by terminating James Damore. Third, our ethical analysis shows that firing Damore was in the greatest interest of our stakeholders. It provided the most justice. Finally, by implementing our recommendations, including the Google Star System, the improved onboarding process, and the Googler Plus One mentoring program, we will continue to improve and progress our Google culture. Our hope is that when Google employees walk in the door, they feel at home. They do not feel compartmentalized and judged based on their gender roles, but they, they are at home at the Google for everyone. The Google that provides justice, rights, and inclusivity to everyone. Now I'd like to open the floor for discussion. I have a concern that the presentation doesn't give us guidance on the, the potential ambiguity between open forum and diversity. Because diversity of opinion, diversity of thought, and as you deal with disruption and innovation, while I may personally not like the comments that that man made, how are you reconciling how if we're using the, the CEO chairman um, own words of diversity, inclusivity, and innovative, aren't we still vulnerable? Aren't you still creating this space where diversity of thought is not being addressed? And we encourage diversity of thought, and that is something that we really pride ourselves on. We discuss this thoroughly about the contents of D James Damore's memo, and we came again to the conclusion that a lot of it is fair to question, and there's a lot of things that he mentioned that are we would not have fired him on. The piece that we decided was uh, in violation of our code of conduct was the one speaking into women's biological inferiority to males, and that is the reason for the discrepancy in STEM and in at Google specifically as well. So we want to make it clear that many of the things in the memo are good to question, and that debate is still ongoing at Google with him not there. It's just that his um, presence being so disruptive because of the specific statements he was fired for legally, um, that is the reason he was fired, not his... Uh, just a quick follow-up. Are you still making the company vulnerable based on your recommendation? If we're still having diversity, we may choose to define diversity in terms of people, but we are a culture in which diversity of thought is valued. So I'm having trouble seeing how we would be protected with the diversity of thought if we leave it just simply the blanket word of diversity. Do you see what I'm saying? So I wonder if we could mitigate that risk, would it be appropriate, I'm not sure you know, what our lawyers would say, but to release the um, analysis you did to our employees, to the public, so they can see some of the things he said were perfectly within our code and our values of diversity and questioning things, but some were not and he was, he was fired for these things. And so it, it shows we do value many of the things he said and maybe that protects us somewhat. What do, you, what do you think about that? Yeah, that was kind of the main argument for the business position. Uh, the discussion posts, posts and um, comments he made, uh, they're still ongoing. And uh, the specific quotes he made were not productive. and. Uh, not part of our values. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. so thank you, but uh, back to the question of, do you think that we should release this analysis you did, all of it, to the employees or the public so that they can we, we can um, follow our value of transparency and that can mitigate the risk of people thinking we fired for general statements and not for this specific piece? 
So absolutely, I think um, that there is a valid argument to the potential of vulnerability that you're bringing up. So any way that we could help, and I, I, I feel like this may be almost uncharted territory, that how do you navigate situations before they even arise? So if we have any tool at our disposal to help you know, sh show how we're shaping our culture, I think would be a value add. You know, one of the um, one of the issues that I think <coughs> companies in our space are are grappling with, and this is, things like this right happen, right? We we are became great, right, and will continue to be great. This culture, and you talked about it, right? There's something about this Google culture where everybody, in some ways, everybody wants to be like us, right? But then this happens. Right? And we have this ethical framework. Right? We, a lot of people spend a lot of time on this ethical framework. What happened? Like, why is that ethical framework, you know, how did, how did we fail as a company to get that ethical framework sort of institutionalized rather than something that's a, on a plaque on a wall? So, oh, go ahead. Yeah. One thing is emphasizing what our employees need to do, and above all, is follow the code of conduct. And I think part of the open discourse started to override that. So we just need to be clear about what our values are and how they are laid out, and really emphasize that portion. So a follow-up is: Do you think you know that they were you know companies that started like? us, you know, they call us unicorns, right? Mm -hmm. So like, at some point though, we have to kind of become a horse, right? Like, you know, uh, you know, so we have to grow up at the size of a company like ours. Do you think that with the recommendations you made that we can retain the good of the culture, right? Um, and still be as innovative, as fast moving, Right and as relevant as we've been um, with you know some of those recommendations and making sure that we kind of turn in that that ethical framework. And what might be some of the challenges in doing that? Yeah, we have discussed this um, pretty thoroughly. These recommendations are a first step, and we believe that by implementing these right off the bat, we will be able to further innovate, in, innovate, excuse me, past these, such as investing more money in certain programs to help our diversity and inclusion programs. And by implementing these right off the bat, we are showing that we're still a unicorn and stepping forward and handling this issue right up front instead of trying to, you know, mosey around it without actually addressing the true issue, which is that there's gender discrimination. And I think that by taking this first step, we will be able to innovate in the future. Created. And adding on to what Kenzie has said, we also like to think that um, our culture has shaped who we are and has led to a lot of our innovation. And these instances, like with this James Moore memo, our memo are more isolated than they are a pervasive problem throughout the company. So by addressing them up front and implementing these steps, we're, we're ensuring that it's not gonna happen in the future and that it, it doesn't become a pervasive problem. I mean, and granted, it still exists implicitly, um, which is harder to address, but through these recommendations, we feel that it is the, the first step in kind of confronting it. Taking you a little bit beyond the first step and helping me, because I'm still struggling mm -hmm. with the whole notion of what the gap is, what do you recommend in a company like ours that values open discourse and it values disruption. We have a culture that has certain values, but there's clearly a gap in how that gets applied so that everyone understands what the limits are. And it's more than just inclusion, it's more than just the standard diversity policy. It's how we talk to each other. How are you recommending that we 
deal with culture lapses that allow people to feel that in the spirit of who we are, we can take on each other in a way that disrespects who they are. I think one way that Google can begin to address this is to have some sort of cushion up front because as as you said, one one thing that one cause of the gap is cultural differences. So if somebody speaks and says something and it's due to a, a cultural lapse and you know it's misinterpreted or highly offensive to somebody else, that we're not super reactive and we immediately fire them. That that employees feel comfortable speaking their mind in this form of open discourse and that they're not gonna get terminated. However, there's 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 clear there's a clear line in the sand that okay we we recognize the cultural lapse. However, you know it, it can't it can't cross line into discriminatory language, and and we we have to recognize as a company that we can't be reactive in those sort of situations. Um, I I think that you have some nice ideas about um, what to do inside our company for our employees. What I'm wondering about is. Um, John, you were mentioning how you don't see a direct financial implication of the firing, um, but there were those two female uh, candidates, I believe, yeah. that withdrew their application. So I'm wondering, what are your recommendations about outside of Google? So we have our current employees, and you have a plan to address them. How do we show the larger community our dedication, and how do we reduce those, maybe not direct, but those indirect financial implications of this firing? Well, and as Kenzie mentioned, that's a really good question. Um, we, you know, these recommendations are initial first step. We have uh, talked about our just <coughs> as she said, funding more different, funding more programs outside. I know there's been talk of possibly even um, investing in a school specifically for women in STEM. So really being able to take those types of ideas to the next level that would help impact different communities in our area as well would be one, one way we could address the address that externally. And one of the recommendations was a state of the workforce report, and that wouldn't just be specific information details about Google, but maybe why why Google's this way. The, the academia and colleges, the, there's a high discrepancy between male and female in computer science programs, engineering programs. Maybe um, doing more research on the causes behind that, um, so working up the pipeline of our you know, potential employees and sharing the results of that um, could be a way to go. And also too, like starting early, I know that that's one of the other uh, issues behind the this, this gap in disparity for, for males and females in STEM. There's certain things like um, Black Girls Who Code and, and other initiatives like that that we can invest in that get that peak that interest for, for girls and young women at a very early age so that they are uh, encouraged and supported to go into those fields. number of things that can be helpful to us, but I'm still very much adrift in the whole notion of things you're talking about affect society. But the women who've already come to Google have already crossed those burden, those barriers, correct? They're already in the workplace because they have that commitment and they're ready to be engaged in that process. So focusing on just, and when I'm at culture, I was really not talking, although I appreciated your answer about cross-culture, I was really talking about struggling with the kind of culture we have. We pride ourselves on a whole bunch of things, but something like what happened reminds us that our culture is vulnerable. And that's the piece I want to get into in terms of the gap. Because your mention of a state of the workforce report may open potential, but take it farther. It's not so much to defend ourselves based on the failings of, because I don't want to hear any more about this. I don't want to see any more stuff about how we in the media are not respectful of our employees. That is, that is hugely invaluable to us. So going forward from this, I want to understand how you think that we can understand how to help our own employees who have a variety of differences. There's probably white male backlash of too much time being spent on other people. We've got 
an amazing group of bright people who are not shy about their views. And we like that on one hand, we don't like it when they get us into trouble. Talk to me, us, a little more about how you really see getting into what will enable Google to be the kind of company where respect is truly lived. So we see that, um, first off, in having to make the decision between firing or retaining more, we needed to make a statement to our employees what we were going to tolerate or what was acceptable and what we wanted to encourage. And to more statements, we couldn't encourage those and we had to take a stand and say, this is what we will not support. And we're setting up these different um, the recommendations that we have in order to monitor the discussion boards, in order to review our code of conduct, our terms of service, to constantly remind them of what we're about and what our values are. And especially the mentorship program and having a diverse pairing of people and really focusing on uh, the culture and what's important and giving everyone a voice in that and feeling comfortable because if they are paired with someone in their department say that is in a senior leadership position they have that sort of close relationship with we would hope that they would feel comfortable in sharing their concerns and feeling empowered and it would just help everyone to feel more included and involved in the culture of google and i think one additional thing we could do is um so these statements were clearly harmful to some of our employees just getting them to share their perspective on why um, would be a big step in addressing uh, the the respect portion of that. Just knowing what your coworkers think about what you say um, goes a long way about shaping how you address them. And and maybe you know backward looking and, and closing some of these gaps. We focused a lot on talking about uh, the women that were negatively impacted by this memo and didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about the employees at Google who agreed with what James Damore had said and maybe bringing them more into the conversation or allowing their voices to be heard more would have, have helped push this idea of diversity of thought further. That your your ideas maybe you know are, are okay to, to share that we're not saying you know we're silencing you, um, and I think one of the main points in his memo was that Google is creating this um, echo chamber where opposing viewpoints are silenced. So maybe being more proactive in hearing everybody's voice rather than you know those that were directly targeted by the memo would help create that more inclusiveness. I, I would say one thing, which is that. Uh, a lot of the people don't think about things to the same extent that you have in your analysis, mm -hmm. and they see a white man spoke up and he got fired. And so although we want to encourage employees to continue to speak up, like you said, we need to be aware of that that um, feeling out there. Mm -hmm. And um, do you have any ways you could you think that would help facilitate that dialogue for, for these um, these employees who may feel like you said they agreed with his, his viewpoint. Yeah. How would we encourage them? Absolutely. So I think one of the, the main things that we can do is be very clear and concise on the reasons why Damore was fired and the specific language that he used that led to his termination and not the fact, not promoting the idea that well he was fired because of his demographic. Mm -hmm. um, so just being very clear and concise about our decision. Mm -hmm. no. All right, thank you. So now we switch into a different role, which is that we give you feedback 